Uh, I am thrilled to be with you tonight. I hear that my brother's been talking smack about me, uh, and, I, and I don't want to break the spirit of what God's doing in here, so I'll get him back another time, all right? But if he's got stories, you can't imagine the stories I got, all right? I say that to say uh, I really don't want to get in the way, and I don't even want to be remembered. I just, I just want to walk into what God wants to say. I'm as confident as I've ever been that the Lord has something to say to us tonight. And I, I don't say that lightly at all. Because he's been saying stuff to me. And so I've been looking over the last 10 months of my life. And the Lord's let us catch a wave. And I've been watching God do something. And I've been watching him do something in me. And I want to share that with you. And so life is seasons, right? If you live long enough, you know you never know what season's coming next. And I think God gives us a picture in the natural of that which is true in the physical and that which is true in the spiritual. You never know what season you're... You might not know what season's coming next. You come to discern what season you might be in. And I think that our nation's in a season. Y'all hear me? I believe that there are things that are happening right now that are being sown into the future of our nation. And a lot of that's bad. Do you agree? There's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of brokenness, there's a, the enemy's getting a lot of headlines. But I want to tell you something, but our king is writing history. So y'all hear me? While the enemy's getting a lot of headlines, our king is on the move. Our king is on the move right now. And I believe in moments of revival, God comes and renews passion. In moments of a real manifest move of God, the Spirit of God comes and gives the people of God clarity about the mission of God so that we can go to work one day that we'll be ready when the kingdom comes unfolding. And so I just want to look in you in the eyes right now and say, our king is on the move. So you might be a little discouraged right now. I know the enemy loves to distract us, but this, this evening, I want to say morning, this evening, I want you to be reminded that there's something worth living for. And so I'm going to give you five things tonight that are coming literally. But I, I normally like to take one text and walk through it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to Bible drill you tonight, baby. All right? I'm going to give you a bunch of texts. So if you're a note taker, get ready to be happy. Happy, happy. Take notes. I want to give you five things to help us renew a passion for far from God people. And I use the term far from God people intentionally because in, in the South, I grew up in Bama, Reno Street, like a mile from this mug, okay? Like, so I, I'm from here. And if you use the word lost, people go, oh, yeah, lost people. That lost people somebody else. You know, the, the lost person is the, the person that's selling meth at Mormon Jordan. You know, like he's way out there. That was funny. Come on now. He's way out there. But we never picture the lost person as our neighbor. We never picture the lost person as the family member. But the truth is this. There's a whole lot of far from God people right here. There's a lot of people that are going to stand before Jesus one day that are not ready. And I believe in a move of God, God reminds us of the mission of God. And so I believe that the Spirit of God brought me here tonight to remind us, listen, time is short. It's time to get after it. So I want to give you a few things. Even the alarm's letting us know. It's time, right? The alarm. That's funny. <laughs> I want to give you five things. Ready? Here's number one. Remember eternity is real. Remember eternity is real. That this life is not all that there is to life. That one decision that a person makes here in their life determines what will happen for their, their eternity. You hear me? That one decision on this planet determines what's going to play out for all eternity. Does a person truly have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Have they repented of their sin and put faith in the finished work of Jesus? That Jesus lived the life you can't live, died the death you deserve, defeated death in his resurrection. What has humanity done with him? What has your neighbor done with him? What has your family member done with him? What have you done with King Jesus? Not what religious box you check. Is there a relationship with the God of the universe? Hebrews 9.27 says, for, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes judgment. There's a news flash for us. The mortality rate of Morris, Alabama is 100%. Everybody's going to die. And you're like, man, he's happy tonight, ain't he? like... <laughs> Every person is going to die. Every person in Jefferson County is one day going to breathe their last breath on this planet. And I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm just being real. 
And every person, hear me, will one day stand in the presence of God. As sure as the sun will rise tomorrow morning, every person you've ever seen will stand in the presence of the Son of God one day. That means every neighbor, every family member, every co-worker, every classmate is heading toward him. Are they ready? When we think of these things, things become clear. One day, listen, court will be in session and our king will rule justly. Are you ready? He's coming. We're moving toward him. It says about the final judgment in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 33, and verse 41, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory. I love that now. Listen to me. You talk about a preaching moment if I had some more time. When he comes in his glory. One day Jesus is coming, and he came the first time as a humble servant. He put on human skin, and we had deity and as humanity right in front of us. But when he comes the next time, he comes in all of his glory. That radiance and transcendence and divinity will be known. Nobody's going to wonder who he is. Everyone will know. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. When the Son comes in his glory, that day is coming. We're closer today than we've ever been. And all the angels with him, he ain't rolling along. And listen to me, they're not coming this time just to give a little message. They're coming to make war. So I love the nativity scene, but I'm not talking about halos and little shepherd staffs. They're coming with a sword. See the scripture and remember the mission. Before him will be gathered all the nations. That's everybody from every time. Every place, every people in God's presence in one moment. This is the final judgment. And he will separate people one from another as a, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Let me tell you what often humanity says. How could a loving God send a person to hell? And the truth is this. How can an honest God call a goat a sheep? All Jesus will do one day is distinguish where we truly are with him. That's not harsh. That's honest. That's not harsh. That's honest. And a just king and a righteous ruler can only say, you don't know me and I don't know you. To the left and to the right. Verse 41, it says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Can we just talk for a minute? That's going to be the best day and the worst day. It's going to be the best day. It's going to be the worst day. It's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be an awful day. That's the only way that plays out when the final judgment comes. Hear me now. We're all heading toward that. That day is coming. It's coming. You never met a person that won't be there that day. You've never met a people group that won't be there that day. There's no, there's no from past, present, or future. We'll all be there. And are you ready for this? In light of that day, God has placed you right now where you are around those that you are to help them get ready. That the Lord Jesus Christ saved my brother and he was right across the hall from me. That the Lord Jesus Christ helped my baseball coach catch fire for Jesus to start sharing with me. Because the God of the universe loves people. He places people. He don't place some people. He places every one of his children. So that you could help people get ready for that day that's coming. That day's coming. He placed you to help as many people as possible. You know what the worst thing about eternal punishment, hell, is that God's not known there. Anybody enjoy God's presence here tonight together, right? Amen. It's different, right? It's different. Well, you can have church but not meet with Christ. But man, you know that church is different when you sense God is here, right? 
Imagine what that's going to be magnified to the jillionth degree one day. No more, nothing in between us and him one day. And imagine the absolute absence of that. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Then on the other side of that right distinction from a holy Jesus, when he says, your sheep, your goat, that's not harsh, it's honest. They will depart from the presence of the Lord forever. No redo. Look at me. That day's coming. D.L. Moody said to preach about hell without a tear in your eyes is a tragedy. That's coming. Where Mark 9, 48 says, where the, the worm does not die and the flesh is not quenched. It's not a bad day. It's bad forever. So the first part is this. Listen to me. Remember, eternity is real. I want us, listen to me, to feel the weight of that for a moment. And then ask the Holy Spirit to help us respond. Anybody grateful, listen to me, that that day for you is going to be an awesome day? <laughs> Anybody grateful that that day is going to be the beginning of life and life more abundant, fullness, perfection, healing, no more hurt, no more sorrow, no more pain, presence of God forever, perfect union with humanity, man, no more war, no more sickness, no more cancer, none of that. That we will finally be home with him and we'll act like the family we were always intended to act like. Now imagine for those that don't know him, everything is, that is opposite of what I just said. It's coming. It's coming. In light of that, how should we respond? I'm going to give you a few ways to respond. You ready? One, pray for far from God people by name. Pray for far from God people. Identify. I believe that God is absolutely bored with our generic praying. We have not because we've asked not. We don't ask in his name. Like, what are we asking him for? Who are you asking Jesus to save right now? Man, I'm talking about if Jesus were to right now save every person we are praying to be saved that you have prayed in the last seven days, how many people would get saved right now? I mean, listen to me, if Jesus said, I am going to save every person that you have cried out for in the last seven days and a move awakening happened, how many, how many eternities would be different? I love what Paul says. Man, you ever read Romans and thought, say what? <laughs> Come on, be honest for a second. All right, listen to me, I got degrees and stuff. It don't mean I always understand it all. And you get to Romans, man, eight, it's like awesome. Romans nine, you're like, say, huh? That's so true. <laughs> like, uh, only arrogant people preach that confidently. Like, I mean, it, it, you, you like, man, you don't know what he's talking about completely. But let me tell you what I do love is that, that, that Paul, inspired by the Spirit, didn't stop in Romans 9. In Romans 10, 1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. That's my prayer is that they would be saved. Acts 26, 18, in light of praying for far from God people, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of, of Satan to God. See, I, I don't think we realize there is a war for every far from God person. That there is a spiritual world and there is a spiritual war being waged right now for every person that you're around that does not know Jesus. And, and listen to me, and the enemy is passionate about them that he will distract them, that he'll give them cheap substitutes, he'll give them religion all day long. He'll say, man, yeah, go to church, that's fine, just don't follow Christ. Be around God's stuff, just don't know God personally, or be completely indifferent, or let me feed you a false doctrine, or let me make sure you're comfortable and safe in, in your wealth. There is a war happening right now around us on every street, in every subdivision, in every workplace. And the war is for the eternity of people. Then they will receive forgiveness of their, for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in him. 
told you that we've been living in a... My chairman of the deacons, Keith Folk, and my buddy's here. Not that I'm in trouble. He just wanted to ride with me, but <laughs> come on. I might be. I don't know. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> no, I, I can't uh, You barely talk about the last 10 months we've been able to live in. On February the 5th, we had a Sunday morning service where Brother David that preached last night helped lead our people to... We're going to pray for far from God people. People that are far from God. We're going to ask you to take some time and just put a name down. Put a first name down. I want you to put the name of a few people. And we gave them time to think about it. And he was leading through that and said, we're going to, we're going to, we made a covenant. We're going to pray every week. Our staff's going to pray every Tuesday over every one of these names. And we ended up having 1,600 cards given with over 7,000, right at 6,000-something names on it. A far, that people identified in a service. While he was leading that time on February the 5th, the baptistry, much like y'all's, ours is up here on the right. I'm sitting down there by Katie, my wife sit by Kathy Jett, his wife, all of a sudden the baptistry water starts stirring. Shh. I ain't never heard her do that before. It's just stirring. The Holy Spirit of God quickened me and he said, Kyle, I'm about to stir the waters. I'm going to take those people and they're going to walk through these waters. So I walked up there in a moment and I said, hey, I told Brother David that. So I think the God wants us. So we all turned on February the 5th toward and those baptistry waters stretched out our hands and said, Oh, great God and King, would you let a harvest come? Would you save far from God, people? Long story short, on February the 19th, stood, preached, simple message, what's your next right step? And 104 people were baptized that Sunday. <laughs> I stood with the wife as we were baptizing her husband who had not been to our church and said on February 5th, I put his name on that cross. On February 19th, he's born again and being baptized right now. Yeah. Stood with an aunt that had prayed for a nephew and his wife that had never been to our church, far from God, put his name on a cross on February the 5th and we prayed over it. Guess what? Born again, baptized. Hey, he hears our cry. Your prayers matter for people's eternities. We prayed for weeks over those cards. Let me tell you one that's dearest to me. Every time we went in there to pray, there's a thousand plus cards. Every time we went in there to pray, Brother David, David Jett, would walk up to me and go, Hey, man, I got Abel's card. We were praying for my eight year old son to come to Christ. Next time we went in there to pray, 1,600-something cards. He goes, Kyle, I got Abel's card again. Fourth time, I was up in the balcony sitting down. He came and sat by me, and he's all choked up. And he says, hey, Kyle, there's 1,600 cards, and I've only got Abel's every time. Next, listen to me. <clears throat> A week later, Abel came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. A few Sundays ago, we had another harvest moment where God saved a bunch of people. And I watched a senior in high school come down to the front, broken, out of the frame, crying. I'm talking about baseball guy, stud. I mean, not a kind of guy that's, that's going to put on a show. He's broken. When our student pastor starts asking, what's going on with you? Man, he goes, listen, I got a friend, Hayes, that he don't, he don't know the Lord. I've invited him to every Wednesday night. I've invited him to every Sunday. He's a stud baseball player. He's self-sufficient. But he just he, he doesn't care. He don't want to hear anything. I've tried to talk to him, tried to talk to him, tried to talk to him. The student pastor grabs hands, the spirit of intercession. They pray for this guy by name. Well, a crusade starts in our region that night. And I'm standing by that student pastor. When one of our pastors comes over and he goes, Man, you know who this guy is? Because there's a huge response to the gospel. Because you know who that kid is? That's the star baseball player at Brandon High School. His name is Hayes. And as soon as he says it, our student pastor goes, I just prayed for him. Eight hours ago. He runs over there and completely disrupts that guy's counseling time. <laughs> completely. <laughs> that dude's like, what are you doing? I'm trying to lead him to Jesus. He's like, man. 
I prayed for you eight hours ago. For this moment right here, that dude gets up and embraces him and comes into the kingdom of God. And we baptize him and 85 more people the next Sunday. Y'all look at me. Jesus is still saving people. He wants to save your neighbors, your family members. No one's too far gone for a passionate pursuit of far from God people kind of God. Third thing, you got to move from just praying. You got to move towards your prayers. Will you boldly compel people to come? This is my, I'm telling you, if I got an evangelistic favorite passage, this is it. Because it moves past all the form and function and how you do it to just the spirit of it. Here's the spirit of a soul winning church. You ready? I believe that God intends, y'all hear me now. I believe God intends for this church to be a soul winning church. Because I believe God's given you a soul winning pastor. And I believe that God has a soul winning anointing for this church. But you got to get this spirit. Luke 14, 21 says this. So the servant came and reported. This is this parable of Jesus. And he's talking about his kingdom and his house. And when, when Jesus gives a parable, he's trying to give us a picture. I don't know anybody visual learners. I'm a visual learner too. My wife big time is a visual learner. If you, you can say it, it's one thing. You show it, she's like, oh, I get it. Like, that's it. Well, parables are pictures. And here's the picture. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house became angry and he said to his servant, he sent the servant out with one task, go and compel people to come. And he goes to the rich and the rich says, I'm good. He goes to the self-sufficient and they say, no, I'm all right. He goes to others that, that think they're, on, they're okay. And listen to me, if you're going to be willing to walk into seeing people come into the kingdom, rejection is part of the deal, baby. Listen, I'd rather feel awkward inviting somebody to come to Jesus or somebody to come into God's house. I'd rather feel awkward when they say no than feel awful when I find out that they've met him. I'd rather feel awkward about their their rejection than feel awful over the fact that I didn't ask them to receive. It says then, The master of the house became angry, and he said to his servant, Go out quickly to the servants in the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Let me tell you what Jesus is looking for. Desperate people. He's looking for desperate people. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and there's there's still room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Here's a question. When's the last time empowered by the Spirit of God with true passion for another person that you compelled anybody to Jesus? When's the last time you looked and said, man, I want to invite you to a king that loves you, to a cross that died for you. I want to compel you not to a religion, but to a real God that is passionate about relationship with you. When's the last time you said, I want to compel you to come. Would you come with me this Sunday into his house and experience his presence? Man, that God would allow this church to be the kind of church that goes highways and hedges, man. That goes to people that have embraced desperation. Listen to me, you can live in a million dollar house and have no hope. Do you hear me? You can have a facade and be hollow on the inside. Everybody's going to stand before him one day. Let's help as many people as possible stand before him in the next few days. To be a house for far from God people. Fourth thing, two more things and I'll be done. Realize that time is running out. Let me tell you what's popular right now. And, and I don't know. I'm not going to make any end time predictions. If you came tonight, I, I ain't got that for you, baby. <laughs> so you go on TV and somebody will tell you something I'm not willing to tell you. But I heard a, a, an older pastor say one time when somebody asked him, are we living in the, the end times? He said, I'm living in mine. <laughs> here's the facts though life's a vapor here today gone tomorrow here today gone tomorrow 
here today. Come on. You are, we are living in our last chance to make Jesus known. John 9, 4, this passage means a lot to my brother and I both. We must work the works of him who sent us while it is day, not it's coming when no one can work. Let me tell you one thing you can't do in heaven is compel people to come to Christ because they're already with him. The one thing you can't do in heaven is witness. The one thing you can't. We can praise him, we can worship him, we can exalt him, we can magnify him. But at that moment, after the final judgment, it's done. We can't invite a neighbor one more time into the presence of God. We can't sit down over a meal one more time and tell somebody about the saving work of Jesus Christ. We we don't want to be praying anymore for people to come into, into the kingdom of God because that day's already come. So we must work the works of him who sent us while his day, not his coming when no one can work. That when the sky parts and our king comes, the work is done. Listen to me, the greatest privilege you'll ever have on planet earth is getting to walk somebody into the throne room of the king of kings and the lord of lords. Listen, when I got baptized, you know know the golf clap we do? When people get baptized, I don't encourage you, man. Get a little more bolsterous with it. You know, like it says all heaven throws a party every time somebody comes to the cross. But when I was baptized, when I came out of the water, the first thing I saw was a six foot five baseball coach with his hands up in the air. Because he knew only Jesus could do that. Let me tell you what I want for you. I want to give you a vision. I want for you in the years ahead. To be able to sit right there and watch right there people you played a part come into the kingdom of God. That you go, I prayed for him. I prayed for her. I shared with him. I shared with her. I asked him to come. I shared with him Jesus. I got to play a small part in their eternity. What else is worth living for? What, What greater thing, investment could you make with your life? From your own home to others. And before you feel like the pressure's all on you, remember Jesus loves far from God people. I got some good news for us tonight. Matthew 9, 36 says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, for they were helpless and harassed, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know that Jesus is never surprised by people's lostness? Because they're lost. You know that Jesus has never been stunned by our sinfulness. That's why he died. Matter of fact, you read the New Testament, read Jesus and skin, let me tell you, the only people he ever gets mad at is religious people. He never gets mad at broken people. He never scolds a broken sheep, man. He heals them. When he stomps out, man, it's that falsehood. It's that being fake. What he welcomes is hurting people, man. Adulterous women, man. Broken people. Everything everything else that we run from, he runs too. He came for broken people, man. He came for you. Helping and harass like a sheep without a shepherd. Luke 15, 1. Now the tax, collector, the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him. Let me tell you what I love about this. I, I really believe this with all my heart. I believe that this is true in every move of God. Messed up people are, are listen to me, are actually comfortable in Jesus' presence. Messed up people are comfortable in his presence. Now, he won't let them stay the same. But they're comfortable in his presence. Let me tell you who's not comfortable in his presence? Religious people. Jesus drives religious people crazy. I love that about him. I love it about him. But boy, you let somebody messed up. Let me tell you what Jesus would do tonight. I believe if Jesus was walking around in skin, I believe he'd be here tonight. I do. I believe he'd be here. Because he went to the synagogue. He went to places. If Jesus was still here in skin. But when he left here, he'd go find somebody broke, beat up. If Jesus lived in your neighborhood, I wonder who he, what neighbors he'd know and eat with. 
what coworkers he'd invest in, what classmates would he sit and eat lunch with. He'd go after broken people. I love that he's not done with religious people either, though. John 3, verses 1 and 2 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, unless you are born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what I love, that Jesus even lets the religious that got real questions come real close. And he has an answer for theirs as well. Tonight, I wonder, would you let the Spirit of God give you a renewed passion for far from God people? For those that are around you? And would you sign up and say, hey, Lord, use me in their lives. We want to see the water stirred, Lord. We want to see the water stirred. You know that none of us received any of these things by our own effort, right? Alistair Begg preached a famous sermon one time as we were worshiping a night and we were giving him all praise. I just remembered. We're all going to stand before God one day. Alistair Begg played out this question that the thief on the cross, remember him? In the last moments that Jesus saved him, he said, I want you to imagine this picture. The thief on the cross, he dies on the cross and he wakes up in heaven. He said, I want to just give you an illustration. I'm not saying this is how it's going to play out. He said, but when he got there, wonder if Peter, one of them came up to him, wouldn't have been at that moment, one of the angels maybe come up to him and say, hey, let me ask you, how'd you get here? Well, you got to know that the thief on the cross would say, I have no idea. What do you mean you have no idea? We've never had anybody that had no idea before. But did, you, did you learn the truth about the Messiah? Did you meet Jesus? And then he goes, man, I really don't know how I, how I got here. Well, I mean, what, what kind of life did you live? A terrible life. Oh, boy. Like, how did you get here? If that would have played out in heaven, eventually, here's the truth. The only answer that the thief on the cross could have gave, well, the man on the middle cross said I could come. Y'all look at me. We're going to get there one day. And when they're going to say, hey, before we let you in here, how, are, how did you get here? And we're going to say, Jesus said that we could come. Jesus said that we could come. But let me tell you what I hope. When we did get there, I'm not saying it's going to play out like this. Jesus said we could come. And he allowed us to help this line of people also know they could come too. To let this line of people know they can come too. I want to ask you tonight, if they can come back and play, if they're going to play, as our response. This. Uh, when, When you... Don't know what to do. I love R.T. Kendall said this famous statement. When you don't know what to do, sometimes you got to try tears. Hey, when's the last time you cried out on behalf of somebody to come to know Jesus? I was talking to some family members earlier about my mom's story, who I know prayed for me and for my brother and many others in our family to come to know him. Her prayers played a part in my salvation. Your prayers can play a part in it. So just bow your head for a moment. Let's respond tonight. Hey, one here, if you need a passion, if you need a renewed passion for the lost, I'm going to ask you, if you're serious about it, if you're serious about it, if you're serious about God using you to help people get ready for eternity, if you're serious, I'm not asking you, I mean this, if you're serious about God using you to pray for far from God people, to pray for the lost, If you are serious about allowing God to use you to compel them to come, if you're serious about that, maybe you come to this altar right now and just kneel before the Lord. Don't wait for anybody else. Just come. If you want to get serious about a move of God in Mars, Alabama, if you want to get serious about people coming to know neighbors, co-workers, say, Lord, I need a renewed passion for hurting people. Now, don't wait on me. You start talking to him. 
Hey, maybe you've given, you've given up on some family members. Maybe you've given up on some co-workers and some neighbors. Don't give up now. Come. Maybe try some tears. He hears you right now. Maybe pray for your church to be an evangelistic church. Soul winning church. Beg him. Beg him like eternity is at stake right now. Beg him. Beg him for people's eternities. If you didn't come, you'd still be a part of this. Cry out. Now, with nobody else looking around, I'm going to ask the most important question there is. For those that are now here and those that are not out there, if you're praying for people and you know that you know Jesus, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. But I want to ask this. Nobody else is looking, just me and your pastor. If you're here and you're not ready for eternity. I am telling you, big decision of your life, eternity is too long to be wrong about Jesus. I'm not asking if you've tried religion. I'm not asking if you come to this church. I'm asking you if today was the day that you were to stand before Jesus and he were to declare a sheep or a goat, meaning a true follower or not, are you ready? If you're not but you know that you want to be, that you believe in Jesus' finished work on your behalf and you're ready to repent of your sin, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you need to be saved tonight, I'm going to ask you to look up at me and raise your hand. Be bold. I'm waiting on you because he's waiting on anybody here that needs Jesus to save you tonight. Just look up at me and raise your hand. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God and others. Praise God. Right over there, I see you. I'm going to let your pastor in a second. You can go ahead and put your hand down. Help lead any of you to Christ that are ready. Eternity's too long to be wrong about Jesus. If that's you and you know you need him to save you, he's going to help you do that. Friends, the Bible says, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says that God is not far from us. We have to come with a faith like a child. So if you looked up a few moments ago and you asked, you said, I I want Jesus to be the Savior of my heart and life. Then with everyone head bowed, eyes closed just here for a moment, would you maybe bow? And we just tell the Lord Jesus, say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I believe that you love me. So Jesus, I ask you to be my Savior. I give my life to you. If that's you here tonight and you ask Jesus to save you, then here in just a few moments, we're going to stand and sing. And I'm going to ask you to be bold enough to maybe come and let one of our pastors know, one of our ministry leaders know. If you're a lady, we've got some prayer counselors up here and we've got some of our pastors up front in these aisles. We encourage you to come and let one of them pray with you. I'm also going to say to you tonight, That if you've got some issues in your life that are keeping you from being the evangelist that God has called you to be, to be the proclaimer of Jesus that He's called you to be, whatever struggle that may be, then I encourage you to come tonight, share that with one of our pastors, one of our ministers, and let us pray over you. It may be as simple as fear. You may be afraid. It may be that you've got some unforgiveness in your heart or bitterness. Hey, listen, you can't expect God to use you if we're not 
good with him. If there's some stuff we got to get, we got to deal with. And so, again, I encourage you to come. Let one of us pray with you. Let one of us counsel with you through these next few moments. But I'm also going to challenge you to do one more thing, church. If you're not one of those people, I felt like the Lord laid this on my heart a few moments ago as Kyle was preaching. James chapter 1 says, Be the doers of the word and not hearers also. You know the distance we are between an awakening of God? You know the distance that we are between hearing what God is doing in one place and seeing it where we are? And church, let me say something. We're seeing measures of it here at Eden Baptist Church. Praise God for that. I'm not satisfied yet. There's too many lost people that don't know him. So this is what I'm going to challenge you to do. I'm going to challenge you, church family, to take one of those connect cards out of the seat back in front of you. If there's not one near you, go find one. I assure you, we've got them around here, and we can restock them tomorrow, okay? And on the back of that prayer portion, or a prayer card on the back of that, I want you to begin to say, Oh, Lord, who are the far from God people in my life? And I want you to take some time and write those names down. And then I want you to begin to stand up and begin calling those names to the Lord. Saying, God, I pray you'd save them. And begin asking the Lord, say, God, what do you want me to do? You may leave here tonight and start making some phone calls. Saying, we got to get lunch this week. You may start talking to some people over the phone and say, as we were at church tonight, I know this is awkward, but I can't help but let you know that God laid you on my heart because he loves you and he wants you to be saved. And so again, there's a couple of invitations here. If you gave your life to Jesus, come grab one of these pastors. If you tonight have a struggle that's keeping you from sharing the gospel with others, come and let one of us pray with you. But everybody else in this room, I want you to take a few moments, grab one of those connect cards, and let's begin to ask the Holy Spirit to lay on our hearts those who are far from God. Can we do that this evening? Can I get some head nods out there? Are you all with me this evening? So let's pray. Father, I ask in Jesus' name. Lord, would you tear down some strongholds right now? God, I pray that those who called out to you to save them, I pray they'd make it public tonight. God, I pray, Father, for those, Lord, who have some true strongholds. God, I pray, Lord, that they would be bold enough to put that in the open and let us pray with one another that we'd be healed. God, I pray you would loose some demons here tonight, that you'd set some people free. God, this is a holy moment. God, I pray that even now you would lay on our hearts the names of those who are far from you in our circles. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.